Open up to Psalm 27, Psalm 27, and if you do have your Bibles, I want to encourage you today, sometimes we bounce around today, we're just going to be in Psalm 27, so please, if you have your Bible, get it out, uh, it'll be very helpful for you to see visibly the structure of the text, because that's going to be part of it today, so I encourage you to uh, to look that up, Psalm verse 20, or Psalm chapter 27. While you're turning there, uh, you may have heard me talk about this before, maybe you haven't, or maybe you heard it someplace else, but Jewish poetry is very different than European poetry. And one thing is the difference is that it doesn't rhyme. It doesn't even rhyme in Hebrew. Uh, it definitely wouldn't rhyme in English, but it doesn't rhyme it, it, with the sounds. Their poetry had rhymes in different ways. They had meters that they used. They had acrostic poems like we have today, and they also used, I don't remember the structure, I always called it a tent poem. And it all comes up to the point. And what you get is on the bottom is the beginning and the end of the poem. And they parallel each other. Then the second to the last and the second thing parallel each other. And you go up a step and up a step and up a step until you get to the center of the poem, which is the point or the main message or the main concept of the poem. I believe, I can't prove this, but I believe that Psalm 27 is one of those tent poems where we have a center point at the middle of the psalm and that going down from the sides, we have others uh, that, that parallel each other. So let's take a look at Psalm 27. We're going to read and study it as we go rather than reading the whole thing first. And then you'll see how this structure works together. Okay? So Psalm chapter 27, verse 1. I'm going to read out... Oh, I'm in the wrong translation. That's not what I needed. I'm going to read out of the King James, which I rarely do, but because I'm dealing with the Hebrew a lot today, uh, the words are, are easier for me to follow. So Psalm 27, I may do my own, some translations, change a few these and thous uh, for those of you who have the New King James or the NIV, you're on your own. Okay, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me in this Will I be confident? That's our first section of the poem, and I titled it, God is my protector. Let's take a look at some of the details in here, and we'll see what I mean. Verse 1, the Lord is my light. The word for light there in the Hebrew is much like the word for light in English. It means light, but it can also be used as a metaphor to describe all sorts of things. What's interesting is that I did not find it used to describe wisdom like the Greeks did. In the Greek, if you see the word light, oftentimes you, it can be a metaphor for uh, for information, knowledge, because the Greeks were very... They're really into the brain. Um, the Hebrews, it was more along the line of liberty, deliverance from enemies, prosperity, safety, that kind of stuff. Well-being. The Lord is my well-being and he's my salvation. Salvation can also... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The Lord is my light does not mean those things. Salvation means liberty, deliverance, prosperity, and safety. Let's go back. The Lord is my light. It can mean joy. <laughs> I'll get it right. It can mean direction. Or clarity, like a clear, bright day. Uh, or it can be day as opposed to night, where you can see what you're doing as opposed to darkness when you can't. So the Lord is my joy. He's my clarity, my day. He's also my salvation, my deliverance, my prosperity, my safety. And then he answers, or then he asks, whom shall I fear? Now, it's interesting. The word fear there can mean two things. It can mean afraid, to be afraid of something like fear for your own safety. It can also mean a reverent awe. Okay? It can mean both of those things. So the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength. Now the word there for strength is actually means fortification. So uh, some translation says the Lord is my stronghold or my strong tower or my fortification. But because it's used as a metaphor for physical strength, it can also be the Lord is my strength or the thing that gives me strength. Of course, we know that from the New Testament. Uh, we can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So the Lord is my strength, of whom shall I be afraid? Now that word fear or afraid there is actually a different word than the other word, and it can also mean two things, be afraid or a reverent awe. <laughs> Not very helpful <laughs> when you're trying to differentiate here. But there is one third meaning of this word for fear that the other one doesn't have. It literally means to make something shake. So you can imagine, you know, shaking out of fear. Like, I don't... I don't do that. But, you know, or you, you get scared. Has anyone ever been scared enough they started shaking? 
I've never been that afraid. It's always in the cartoons where the knees start knocking. I've never seen that, but you, have you been that afraid? Okay, all right. Uh, so let's look at this. The Lord is my light. He is my salvation. Whom shall I have reverent awe of other than Him? Think about that. Who should you revere? God, who is your light, who is your joy, who is your clarity and day, and your salvation, your deliverance, your liberty, your prosperity, your safety. Who is left to have reverent awe of? And yet we have reverent awe of people all the time. Now, what do you think starstruck is? Oh, I ran across, you know, we were in California and I saw so-and-so and I got so excited. Why? He's just a person, you know? I maybe be different if I saw one of my favorite actors. Probably not. I'd probably think, oh, hey, that's kind of cool that I met you. What are the odds? But other than that, you know, I wouldn't be like, You're, I'm not worthy, you know? Because there is no one that we should have reverent awe of other than the Lord. And then, of course, the Lord is my strength. He's my defender. So who should I be afraid of? Who can make me shake? No one can make me shake if God is my stronghold. Uh, anybody see Lord of the Rings or read the books? A couple of you are willing to admit it in front of everybody else. All right. Good stories. Good stories. Uh, they go to the stronghold and they, they, they put everybody in the stronghold. No one can get through the stronghold. And yet the people were still shaking. God is the type of stronghold where you stand there and you know he's my defender and my protector. No one can make me shake or be afraid. Look at verse 2. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host, which is an army, should encamp against me, or war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. We have no reason to fear. That confidence is actually boldness. I like this. Carelessness. Now we use that word today to mean not paying attention and you end up doing stupid things. Literally, it means to be without care. In other words, they didn't care. Ah, oh, look, there's an army. Eh, no big deal. I got no worries because I have confidence that my God is my stronghold. The first section, God is my protector. He's the source of all good things that I need. Go to verse 4. Then we have the second section in the text. Verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord. Now, I want to stop there for a second. <laughs> How many things? One thing. There's only one thing. What's interesting is that he's going to list three. But he says there's only one thing. So one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That's one. To behold the beauty of the Lord. That's two. And three, to inquire in his temple. Let's stop there for a second. What is this great desire of David? You know, when God asked Solomon what he wanted, what did Solomon say? Wisdom. Understanding. Actually, I think, was it understanding? Okay. You know, Solomon said, I, I, I'm not wise enough to rule this nation. Make me wise enough to rule this nation. What was David's one desire? To be with God. Why do you think David was called a man after God's own heart and Solomon wasn't? I mean, Solomon wasn't a bad guy. In the beginning, he made some mistakes, but he wasn't a bad guy. But David was a man after God's own heart. This one thing I desire, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. That word dwell, well, hold on, let's go back to desire. One thing I have desired. The word for desired there means three possible things. To inquire, like to ask, hey, can I buy your car? The second thing means to, uh, let me get the wording right, to request of, oh, I'm sorry, first inquire is, hey, do you have a car for sale? To request of, can I buy that car? And the third one is to demand based on a promise. Hey, you said I could buy your car if I gave you $10,000, here's $10,000, now give me the car. Now we, when we say demand, we think, Bro, give me what I asked for. But this is the idea of you promised me something, and so I am demanding it, as it were. Like, for example, if, uh, if Tim said, hey, Mike, I've got a, a game for you. I want you, want you to have. I'm going to give it to you. And I went over to his house and said, can I have that game? Well, if he hadn't offered me the game, that'd be pretty bold. He'd probably just laugh. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that wouldn't be very polite. But if he had made a promise to me, I can demand of him what he promised because Tim's a man of his word. 
Well, God is also a man of his word. And this, this desire of David is not just an inquiry. It's not just a request. It is a demand. Lord, this is what you told me that you want of me. And so I am going to make a demand on this promise. And what is that demand? To dwell in the house of the Lord. The word for dwell literally means to sit down, but it has two connotations attached to it. The first one is intent, purposefully. This isn't plopping down on a couch. This is walking into a specific place and sitting down on purpose. This is more like a, oh, what do they call those where they sit down in a row so you can't get into the building? Sit, protest, sit in, right? Sit in, do I have that right? Okay. Uh, this is more like that, where you sit down on purpose with intent, with a goal, with something to accomplish. He said, I want to sit down in your presence uh, with intent. The second one is permanence, to sit down permanently and claim that spot as yours. Kind of like when you go to a conference and you sit down and you put your stuff there when you go to the bathroom hoping nobody will sit there. <laughs> you know, this is my seat. Don't leave it. It is this, this, this idea of claiming the spot. He says, uh, the one thing I've desired, the one thing I seek after that I may dwell permanently, sit down intently in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Not Sunday or in their case, Saturday, not just on holy festivals every day of my life. Then he goes on and adds to that, to behold the beauty of the Lord. The word beauty there is delight, splendor, pleasantness. This is a description of worship. Those of you who know what, what intimate worship feels, excuse me, feels like, you'll know what I'm talking about. Those of you who've never experienced it, I want to encourage you to seek after this because it's amazing, it's powerful, and it's what God wants you to do. Okay, what it feels like is you, you come in to God's presence and you sit and you say, God, I want to connect with you. And then you behold his beauty. You stay in that place and you say, God, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to think about how good you are. I'm going to think about all the things that you've done. I'm going to think about the great magnitude of your power and, and the, the great things you've accomplished in the past. I'm going to praise your name, Hosanna. I'm just going to sit here dwelling in your place, beholding your beauty until you and I connect. And then that's the last part, to inquire in your temple or in his temple. The word inquire, I thought this was interesting, the root word for that word means to plow. I was like, okay, so we got creative here. But it literally means to turn over in order to inspect. You ever done that before where you dig a little patch, turn it over and look at the dirt, see how the roots are doing and what the soil's like and if there's any bugs or anything like that? You, 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 you turn that dirt over in order to inspect it. It can be translated inspect, admire, consider, or even to search out. Now, guys, those of you who are married, I'm just going to give you a little hint here. Your wife wants you to want to know her better than you do. Now, you'll never figure her out, so don't even plan on that. But she wants you to know how she works, why she works, what she likes, what she doesn't like. That one's important. Uh, you know what? She wants you to know her so well that when something comes up, you know how she would respond and you do all ahead of time what she wants. That's why when you bring her flowers or something like that, she's like, I was just wanting that. He knows. <laughs> Some of the wives are like, I do not do that. <laughs> That's okay. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to want to know him better. He wants us to desire to know Him. Not because it gives Him some boost to His ego, but because He knows that the better we know Him, the better off we are. He wants us to sit in His presence, to dwell there, to behold His beauty, and to seek after knowing Him better. Now this section continues, verse 5, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Now, I always got the image of God taking me and putting me someplace safe, like way over here where my enemies won't find me. But really what that word originally meant was to hoard. To like, to collect and, and store. It's more of a jealous thing where God's, where somebody attacks you and God goes, no, 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 he's mine. You can't have him. Notice that it says that uh, um, 
He shall hide me, not just in the rock, in His pavilion. He will hide me where He is because He wants me. It's like, now, this guy's mine. You can't have him. That's the attitude that God has. It means to keep close, to reserve, or to protect. Go to verse 6. And now shall my head be lifted above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Now joy there actually comes from the word for a trumpet blast. So this is like, uh, some of you say shouts of joy. Uh, but it has, it's not just a voice. It can also be shouts of joy through a trumpet. This is a, a big exclamation of God's goodness and his glory. And then the word sing uh, means to sing with your voice, that one's easy, and then sing praises unto the Lord. That word there is the word to pluck strings. So this is playing uh, stringed instruments, like David had a harp, Tim has a guitar, you know, the, uh, the Cindy has a piano. Those are stringed instruments to play music to the Lord. So this is shouting. This is singing with your voice. This is playing instruments before God. In other words, this isn't just an accidental, yay, thanks God. This is an intentional purposeful declaration of God's goodness. Verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. You know, I always got confused on that one too. Because when you cry out to the Lord, are things usually good or bad? Yeah, they're usually not very good when it's time to cry out to the Lord. But look at the context of what it says. Verse 5, no, verse 6, said, I will shout for joy. I will sing. I will play instruments for the Lord. Oh Lord, when I cry, hear my voice. David isn't saying when I cry out because I'm in danger. He's saying when I sing these praises to you, hear me. And then at the end of the verse it says, and answer me. How does God answer praise? Well, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, what does he do in response when we are singing and praising Him. Well, He does in verse 8. Verse, or section 2 was verses 4 through 7. So we've got the first section, God is my protector. Second section uh, so, uh, is a desire to be closer to God. Then we have the center point, verse 8. Now you may be looking at it saying, but verse 8 isn't the middle verse. That's because these numbers didn't come from the Hebrew. They were added later, okay? I'm looking at lines here. When thou saidst, Wow, that's hard to say. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Now, how many of you have, My heart said to me, or when my heart said, Seek my face? Anybody have a personal on that one? Or it says, I do that? Right, some of you have that. That's because there is no noun at the beginning of that. It starts with, uh, Oh, let me look here. It starts with, Seek and then ends with face. So we don't know if God says, seek my face, or if we say, seek my face. I don't know. It does because the word's just not there in the Greek, and un, or in the Hebrew. And unlike Greek, where you always know what the pronoun is because it's added to the verb, in this case, we don't have that. So we don't know what it is, but I'm just going to assume that it's when God says, seek my face. So picture this. David said, God, you are my protector. And so I want nothing more than to sit in your house, dwell in your presence, to, to inquire about you and know you better. And then I'm going to sing shouts of joy and, and, and exclamations to you. And then I want you to answer. What does God say in response? Seek my face. Sounds kind of odd. Seek my face. What does that mean? To seek someone's face. Have you ever looked for someone's face in a crowd? Uh, that's really hard. I usually look for shirt color. <laughs> you know, what color is your... Okay, they were wearing red. And you scan for red. And then you look for the faces. because, Especially if you get a big crowd. When we were at camp, I did that a lot. It's like, okay, uh, uh, no, I don't see them. And then try to look for them someplace else. Because you don't want to walk all the way down there. It's 100 degrees outside. But this idea of looking for someone's face. Your face is where all your emotions are expressed. Your face is where your uh, nonverbal communications come out. People can see your intent in your face. That's why when I have difficult conversations with people, I don't want to do it over the phone. I definitely don't want to do it in email. I want to do it face-to-face -face so that I can see their face. 
Because when you see their face, you know them better. It's kind of like, um, you know, when uh, uh, someone loses a loved one, one of the things that, uh, that's real common that really strikes them is when they can't remember their face. They're like, oh man, I've forgotten what their face looks like because it represents their person, who they are. All their expressions and emotions and intents come out in their face. And God says, seek the real me. I want you to know me. I don't want you just to know the, the Bible with what I said and what I did. I don't want you just to know the stories. I want you to know me. I'm the point. I'm the purpose. You're here to worship me. You're here to know me. And so he cries out to the people and says, seek my face. Now notice David's response here. My heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, I will seek. It's David's heart that replies. In the Hebrew, that word heart means core, like an artichoke heart or a tree heart or something like that. It means the middle part. You got to understand the the, the ancient Jewish people didn't have a concept of the spirit like they did in the New Testament times. And so they really thought of themselves as body and then everything else. Your thoughts, your emotions, your wills. That was all your spirit, if you will. That's the real you. And then your body, you know, dies and moves on. They understood that part. But they only had the two. It wasn't until uh, the time of Jesus where they were talking about body, soul, and spirit. And so this is the center core of who you are. David is saying, the very core of my being cries out a response, your face I will seek. Can you say that honestly about yourself? Can you honestly look inside the core of who you are and say, God, that's really what I want most. I want you more than anything. I, and you know, you may say, well, I want that, but I don't do it. No, I understand. That's flesh. That's imperfection. That's part of this life. And praise God, we're going to get rid of it when we get to heaven. We won't have any more of those stupid distractions. Okay? I'm not talking about perfection, but when what you really, really want, the, the, the deepest core inside of you, what is it you desire? Because if it's not God, that means somebody else is sitting on his throne and he doesn't share seats well. We have to make sure that when God cries out to us, seek my face, the very core of our being can respond honestly, Lord, your face will I seek. You know, the other day I came up here to the church, uh, was getting ready for Sunday and, and was preparing things and, and, um, uh, I had planned something rather, not elaborate, but you know, it, it had bread involved. So, you know, you always got to start an hour earlier when you're making bread. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll go home and, and get that ready. And, and I'm, I'm getting ready to walk out the door and I just feel this tug. I just finished this sermon, by the way, and I felt this tug, and God said, will you seek my face if I ask you? And I thought about it for a second, and I thought, yeah, I, I will, I will. You know what? Forget supper. I know we've got uh, the fair tonight that we're going to. I know that you know it's going to be really busy, and we need to get supper done, but you know what? We can have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Actually, we couldn't. We didn't have any bread. But that was my answer. We're going to have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I, and I was, I turned, I turned right around. I was going to head to the piano and spend time with God. And he said, I was just checking. Go home and make the bread. <laughs> so it didn't cause a problem. But, you know, he wanted to know, will you seek my face? Are you serious? And when, when we come to that moment where God says, will you really seek my face? You know what, God? Let me just, let me just finish this over here first. It's too late. You know, Jesus said, whoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of my kingdom. We can't let God be second to anything. He said, let the dead bury their own dead. You follow me. When God cries out to you and says, will you really seek my face? Well, does the core of our being answer your face I will seek? Is that what we really want? And then ask yourself this question, why are you here this morning? Are you here to get a little... Bible teaching. Maybe you're here to see your friends. You're here to fill a duty. Here because that's just what you do on Sunday mornings. Those are your answers, I'm sorry. Those are not very good answers. <laughs> not because they're just wrong, but because, you know, I was tired this morning. Anybody else tired this morning? It's like, man, I do not want to get out of bed and go to church. Come on, God. But I came because I knew I could meet God here. And I knew I could meet him with all of you, and I wanted that. Hey, it's my job, too, but that's not the main reason why, <laughs> why I do it. I do it. I've always gone to church. I, even when I was, you know, graduated and moved out and stuff like that, I still went to church every Sunday. Why? Oh, because you just do that. No, because God was there. I know he's everywhere, but when I'm there, 
There's nothing else. It's like getting away for vacation. Like, well, I should be able to relax at home. Yeah, but you just can't sometimes. Sometimes you just got to get away. And that's what this is supposed to be, a place where we can come and God can say, seek my face, and we can respond honestly, your face will I seek. That's the center point. Now we get down, we got to the top, now we're going back down the other side. There's only four sections and a center, by the way. So the second to the last section, which is next, is a parallel of the second section in the beginning. So let's read it. Verse uh, 9. Paul, or Paul, David just kind of switches here. He says, hide not thy face from me. He just said, God just said, seek my face. Well, don't hide from me. What? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. We'll get to that in a minute. Hide not thy face from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. What, what is he saying there? I, do, I can't prove this, but I personally believe that David... What happens when you get in the presence of God? Now, I don't know about you guys, but the first thing that happens to me is all those sins come up to the surface and you feel like repenting. God, you know, I did this and I did this and I did this. And I remember one time I was doing that. I come up front and I'm kneeling at the front and I'm, the music's playing and I'm worshiping. All of a sudden, all these sins come up and I start feeling bad and I just get ready to cry. And God says, shut up! <laughs> I don't need to hear this. I have forgiven you of that. You've even asked me to forgive you of that. Can we please let it go and move on to just building relationship? Yes. I think the answer to that one was yes. Pretty sure. But that's what happens. And I think David, he's sitting there, he's, he's writing this song. I don't write songs, but I've heard from people that do, that there's this, this ask Tim, he writes songs, there's this strange presence that comes on you and you can just feel God feeding words. Am I right? I've heard that from other people. And David, he's feeling this, and God speaks to him and says, Seek ye my face. He's like, God, your face will I seek. But I am a sinful person. <laughs> And he said, please don't hide your face from me. Don't send your servant away in anger. That's what gives me the hint that he's talking about sin because God's anger is always against sin. He says, you have been my help. Don't leave me. Don't forsake me. And of course, he didn't have the promise of Jesus that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then he says, oh God of my salvation, you are the one who saves me. Please don't leave me. And then he then he's either reminded by God or he reminds himself in verse 10, even if my father and mother forsake me, the people that should care about me the most forever, even then will the Lord take me up. David knew rejection. His own son tried to take the kingdom from him. His own son tried to have him killed. He knew rejection. And yet he said, even when others reject me, God will take me up. When those sins rise up in your throat and you remember the mistakes that you've made and the devil's over there slapping you around saying, look what you did, look what you did, you can say, I don't care who rejects me, God still takes me up. Verse 11, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path. It means a flat uh, road because of my enemies. The teach me, uh, it, it, it comes from the root word of shooting an arrow. It's almost like pointing out. You know, hitting the bullseye right there. That's what I want you to do. That's the idea of teach, okay? So he's saying, point out to me exactly where to go at each moment and then make my path straight so that I don't stumble and fall. And then he says, because of my enemies. Now, what does his enemies have to do with that? Well, I know today we have an enemy that's waiting for us to slip up. He'll help, he'll help cause us slip up and then he'll say, look what you did. We need to know the path of the Lord and be, and have straight, plain paths because we have an enemy that's waiting to devour us and he needs no excuses. Verse 12, deliver me not over into the will of my enemies for false witnesses are risen up against me and such as breathe out cruelty. That parallels the desire to get close to God. You think, well, what, what does that have to do with it? Because it's that closeness that desire to dwell in the presence that reminds us that God will not forsake us, that He will teach us. And it's in those moments that He reminds us and He teaches us so that our enemies can't get the upper hand. 
Then the last part, verses 13 and 14, are parallel to the first part. Um, if you have the King James, it says, I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Um, it, there, it really, it starts with unless. That's kind of a weird word in English to start with. Unless what? <laughs> Something or I would have fainted. I believe he's referring to... Uh, not fainted, uh, I believe he's referring to the stuff above. Deliver me not into the will of my enemies. Don't leave me, don't forsake me. Those things would have happened if I hadn't believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This believed is a confident, a confident faith, unshakable faith. We have to have faith that God is with us and he is for us. And that if he is for us, who can be against us? We have to have faith. Because if we don't have faith, what's going to happen? The enemy's going to get in. He's going to get in, he's going to attack, and he's going to find a chink in your armor, and he's going he's to hurt you. He can't destroy you, but he can certainly maim you enough that you won't be effective, at least for a while. Think about all the you know big mega church pastors that have fallen over the years and how those ministries have seriously diminished because of their moral failure. We have to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of the enemy, but we have to have faith. In what? We'll go back to the beginning. The Lord is my light, my salvation. He's my strength. Whom shall I be afraid? Faith that God takes care of us. Look at verse 13, or 14, excuse me. Well, hold on a second. Go back to 13. Let me show you one more thing. Unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord when I get to heaven. Is that what it says? It doesn't say that, does it? It says, in the land of the living. Now, yes, heaven's going to be awesome. But faith isn't just for the off and the wander. Yonder, excuse me. I get my colloquialisms mixed up. But at least I can say colloquialism. Uh... Watch me pronounce it wrong. <laughs> there is something for you right now. God wants to be your strength right now. He wants to be your light and your joy right now. He wants to be your salvation today. Not just when you get to heaven. And we have to have faith in that. Notice what he says. He says, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We have to have faith that God is there for us now, not just in the hereafter. Go to verse 14. Let's wrap this up. Wait on the Lord. Now David is talking, giving direction to the reader. This is the summary, if you will, and it matches the first part. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. The wait means to look, to tarry, or to expect. Being bored isn't waiting. Waiting is like this. Looking. Scanning the horizon for what we know God has promised and expecting it. In the Greek, the best word I can think of to translate is the word for hope. It's an expectant hope, not wishful thinking. And this isn't just a, well... I guess I don't have anything else to do until God moves, so I'm just going to sit here and mope. No. Or how about this? This one's my favorite. Well, God's going to bless me in the hereafter, so for right now, I'm just going to hunker down and let the devil beat me up. No. That's not what this means. What did David just say? He said, the Lord's my strength. He's going to deliver me from my enemies. He's going to protect me. Waiting isn't about just hanging around. It's not loitering. <laughs> Waiting is being intentional on the Lord with expectation. And then it says, be of good courage. The word courage means be brave. You don't just sit there and let God beat you up. You are brave and you fight back against the enemy while you sit in the presence of the Lord. Claim that spot. This is my ground. And the New Testament says, when you've done everything else, just stand. That's what that means, to wait in that place and say, God, you said... I'm not moving. And the devil comes up and says, you're going to move. No, I'm not. Because my God is my defender and he will not reject me. Even when my father and mother have forsaken me, the Lord will take me up. 
Be of good courage. And then it says, uh, the Lord will strengthen thy heart. Now, some of your translations change that a little bit because it's implied that the Lord will strengthen your heart. Some of them say, uh, 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 take heart, I believe the NIV says. So it's kind of an idea of strengthening your own heart. But I believe it's talking about God giving you the strength because it is through the strength of Christ that we can do all things. So strengthen your heart or let God strengthen your heart and be of good courage. And then Paul repeats it. Now, that's important. In Hebrew, if you repeat something, it means it's extremely important. If you say it three times, it means it's immediate. But if you hear it twice, it means it's very important. That's why when, when Peter was up on the roof and he saw the vision of the unclean animals, he said it happened three times. So that God was saying, look, as soon as this is done, the guys knocking at the door, those are the ones you're looking for. And it happened right away. But when it repeats itself twice, it means pay close attention. It's like a megaphone. Listen! This is important. He says, wait on the Lord. And then he repeats it. Wait on the Lord. God's desire for you is to have relationship with Him. And some of you may think I'm beating a dead horse because I talk about this all the time, relationship with Jesus. Well, if he would just just preach the word instead of relationship with Jesus, just tell me what the Bible says about choices I make or sin. I'll even hear about sin. Just quit talking about this relationship with Jesus. It's funny. I was talking to the long-term care. Actually, it was both Ridgewood and long-term care at a chapel on Thursday. And and uh, I said, you know, if you if you bought a car and the tire went flat, you wouldn't say, oh, well, I guess I'll get another one. You would fix the tire, right? That's why God restored relationship with man, because he created man so he could hang out with him. Then man sinned, and it broke it. And he didn't say, oh, well, I'll go make another one. No, he fixed what was broken, because what he wanted from the beginning was us with him. That's where the whole 17th chapter of John is all about that, in us and in him and us and each other, and we're all together in this one big pile of mess of in. With and in and together and that stuff. There aren't enough prepositions in English (laughs) to describe the relationship God wants with us so close, like a married couple, a a good one. (laughs) I know some married couple's a bad example. No, that, that close, intimate, personal sharing with each other. That's why God made you. And here he says, seek my face. I'll take care of the rest. I'm your light. I'm your salvation. I'll deliver you from your enemies. I'm your strength. Just seek my face. I want to encourage you today to make that a priority. You know, I was talking with another pastor just the other day, and he said, and I told him that God had shown me that, that our church, a lot of the people in our church are going through difficult times. And he said, Mike, it's not just your church. It's happening in ours too. And he's not talking about infighting. He's just talking about people are dealing with junk, sickness and, and, and failures with crops and cattle getting sick and, and things breaking down in the house and, and relationships being destroyed with family and all this stuff that there's brokenness everywhere. He said, the devil's working double time to break us. And I said, let's not let that happen. And he's kind of a young fellow and he said, well, what do we do? I said, let's get close to God. He's our solution. He wants you to be close to Him because when you are close to Him, He can then take care of you. God is our strength. He's our refuge and our protection. So we need to seek His face and then wait on the Lord. And that takes time. I don't want anyone to feel bad, but when I... Boy, that got your attention, didn't it? Uh, When I go to town to run errands, I see... Five people minimum that I know have to talk to at least two of them. Don't feel bad. Even though I got stuff I got to do, you know, I'm here to actually get the mail, not minister to people. But I remember my pastor told me one time, he said, Micah, when I was just getting ready to come up here, he said, don't forget, ministry is time. He said, everything takes longer than you expect because it just takes time. If you don't take the time, it doesn't work. You can't rush it. God's saying the same thing. Wait on me. It takes time. It takes time. Well, God, okay, I got five minutes before I got to go. All right, here we go. Let's have some quality time. God says, you want quality time with me? Sit down. Pull up a chair. Grab a cup of coffee. 
Let's spend an hour together. Oh, I gotta get to work. Well, you could get up a little earlier, but then I would be up earlier. <laughs> That's the only excuse I've got. We need to make sure that we seek the face of God so that we can know Him better, so that when the devil attacks, we're ready. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank You so much for being the God of relationship. And that even though we're distracted all day long by all the different things that are going on, I know that You patiently hold out Your hand to us. That You are waiting for us to come to You, to sit in Your lap, to, to, to dwell with You and, and behold Your beauty and, and seek after knowledge and, and, and understanding of who You are. Father, be patient with us still as we learn how to do this as a congregation as a, and as in individuals that we might wait on You. Thank You, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. Does anybody have anything that needs to be added to that? What? Do you need a microphone? Could I have to come up here then? Um... This is part of my Sunday school notes that we're going to get to next week. Um, but, uh, yeah, I have it all written down. It's fabulous. I prepared for this. <laughs> um, but God said, go ahead and share it. When we're going through stuff, the big stuff, you know, there's the day-to-day, -day, but when we're going through those ones that are really, really a challenge, and you're crying, and, and you're crying out to God, but you're also crying a lot, and uh, you cry out and you're just saying, God, what do you want me to do? I'm doing everything I know to do. What do you want me to do? And God says, you got the devil right where you want him. Just sit at my feet and praise. You know, that's what he wants us to do, is just sit there and praise him. You got the devil right where you want him. So just stand.